ko Helen Cooper aho, ke he kamahi aho, ki te core education tatai aharo. So a huge welcome to the audience here. We've got Michael Howell from um, Lenfield College, uh, Fiona Grant from the Manaya Kalani Trust, um, Chris Dillon from Cambridge High School, who's been involved in the development of uh, the, um, the new technological areas within the New Zealand curriculum, um, and Janelle Rikiwaka, who has been uh, with, with Core Education and also been involved in the development of the Hangaro Matahiko um, areas of the curriculum. So we will kick off and, uh, and make a start. But firstly, I'd just like you to introduce yourself. So, Michael. I'm really interested in, in, in lots of fields in school, I think, which is a bit different um, in lots of things in general. I like to learn about uh, anything and everything. So yeah, I think that's just, that's all, that's all it is to me. Uh, kia ora, uh, nā mahi nui ki a katoa. My name is Fiona Grant and I'm currently, I'm a teacher. I'm currently um, collaborating with a group of educators supporting schools as part of uh, the Manaya Kalani Education Programme. Um, my interest in being here today is I'm, I'm really interested and excited that um, of, of, with the inclusion of the um, digital technologies in the curriculum and the opportunity to uh, see the draft and think about how that's going to impact us. But for me, I spend most of my days in the classroom with teachers and um, our young people. Um, Manaya Kalani as an education programme is really focused on um, elevating and raising achievement for our young people and uh, along with effective teaching practice. Um, harnessing digital technologies has been critical to um, empowering and um, supporting our learners. Uh, kia ora, my name is Chris Dillon. I'm a teacher of digital technology at Cambridge High School. Um, I have came into teaching from a uh, design industry. Um, so I'm, I was a user before I was a teacher. Um, I've been an early adopter as from from decades ago. Uh, so I was on the in, I was on um, the internet in what was it ninety three or ninety two whenever it sort of started. Um, you know I was watching the numbers go up sort of to th twenty thousand online, forty thousand online that that sort of um, thing now into its millions, billions, and other things. So um, it's been interesting. It's been a, a a, a long trip. It's really exciting being here now at this point where um, as digital technology teachers we actually have a name that we can put forward and people actually now I think understand what it is that we're actually talking about. Um, and I'm um, just looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Kia uh, Tēnā tātai. Uh, he uri tēnei no tainui waka. Uh, no whaingarua ahau, engari noho ana au ki o tautahi, ko Janelle Ricky Waka toku ingoa, kia ora. My name is Janelle uh, and I work for Koa. I'm also a, a trained um, primary teacher and bilingual and immersion teacher as well and I've worked in both English medium and bilingual education. I um, have just always been a, I've certainly been a consumer of digital technologies for a long time and a fan of digital technologies. Uh, I think in my early days of teaching I was really interested in how it can support the learning of uh, some of our students, particularly students that were struggling. Um, and then in my role at CORE I have had lots of different roles over the years in supporting teachers to adopt uh, technology uh, and use it effectively to support students. I've recently been involved and led the team that have developed the exemplars for Hangarau Matihiko, which is the Māori medium version of the draft curriculum. Um, and in particular, we've developed the first lot of exemplars for um, Whakaro Rorohiko, which is computational thinking in Hangarau Matihiko. So that's uh, what brings me here today, and I'm um, very grateful to be here. Ngā mahi. 
So, um, as I mentioned before, on uh, EdSpace, so you can all um, access EdSpace, we've started a conversation up there, so this conversation can be con uh, continued beyond this immediate discussion. Um, so, from the student's perspective, what I can see in terms of why we want digital technologies and why it's been implemented now is um, outside of school students use digital technologies in their daily lives all the time and to be able to take that from home and school and use it both in, in the classroom and at, at home I think is an important aspect of life that's going to become more important to future generations and children growing up in schools now. Um, I think it's important because we need, we need to learn how to use digital technologies safely and properly and use it really efficiently and effectively, um, both at, at, in the home and in the school environment. And do you think, there's, do you think that's uh, something that needs to actually be part of the curriculum or do you think kids naturally learn how to use it so safely? Um, students obviously naturally learn how to use digital technologies, or yeah, more specifically the internet and what that is, but I think that it's important to be able to have that opportunity to teach students about the harms, the benefits, and what the outcomes and what the benef uh, what like, good uses can come from efficient and effective use of digital technologies. Thank you. I uh, totally support that, absolutely. Um, for, from my perspective, um, a lot of my role is around uh, working with our teachers and our learners to ensure that they are making smart decisions when they're using the technology. Um, as Michael mentioned, it's being um, used a lot um, in our everyday life. So again, too, that's not always um, equitable across our society. So you will have lots of areas where um, there are people who have more access and people who have less access. So I think it's really important that um, in terms of our schools and our kura um, are a place that we can ensure that that, e that access is equitable and that um, our, all our communities, that, so it's including not just the young people at school, but our teaching communities, our uh, whanau and um, the wider school community are also partnering in the decisions that are being made about how technology is being harnessed um, to support our young people in learning. So Chris, Michael's raised the issue of you know, learning about digital citizenship, safety, and, and, um, and Fiona's taken that further to actually talk about the equity issues. Do you see both of those issues as key drivers for the curriculum developments that we've got? Yeah, I think absolutely. I'd like to um, echo, I think, what Michael was saying. I think most people in New Zealand are consumers. We, we've all con well, most people probably are connected. Um, in terms of access and equity, I think it was only this year that the last school in the country became connected. So we've had, we've had um, internet connection within schools, within schools I've been working in for 15 or more years, but if that means that the last school is only just now getting to that stage where they're even going to be able to log on to anything, um, then that's a big step. And that's going to take a, a huge, there's a huge learning curve there involved in that because they're not coming in at the same level that we did 20 years ago when we were starting or you know, 15 years ago. Um, but you're, um, they're having to now work with technologies that we're used to being around us, we're, we're logging on, we're using applications, we're um, cross-referencing it to our phones and the other things that are around us, or our watches. Um, but you've got people that haven't had that opportunity, uh, even at ground level. Now they're going to be um, needing support, and I think one of the things that the, um, this implementation uh, 
and highlighting of digital technologies allows us to actually develop those support structures. Um, it's been, it's always been there. This is not a new part of the curriculum. Digital technology has been on the curriculum as a, a named thing for over a decade, but now its, its name has now, it's out front, as I was saying earlier, it's something that probably um, I think most people will now recognise as being a thing. Um, it's not computing, it's not simply um, information transfer, it's, it's more, it's, de it's a lot deeper than that. Um, I think one of the, um, the really interesting things is that um, it's not just about being consumers, though it is about becoming, um, for learners to actually take control of their technology, not just be passive. It's not just something that you have to, you have to react to every couple of minutes because your, phone, because your pocket's buzzing. You should be more um, integrated than that. Um, yes, we've got uh, issues. We've got, um, I think one of the big issues about um, te using technology is actually staying, what does it mean to have a footprint? What does it mean to be, um, I think in the keynote earlier, they were talking about the two-year-olds having a digital shadow. You know, if you're, you're born into that world. It's not something I knew, but it's, um, it's reality now. How are you going to um, control or manage or um, ensure that your digital footprint is positive? Yeah. And so there's, there's um, three key words that sort of often are used uh, or terms. So in the curriculum, the draft curriculum, it talks about being um, uh, digitally capable. Uh, we also hear a lot about digital literacy and then we hear the next sort of level of digital fluency. So, and what you've been saying about, you know, digital natives, how do you see those three terms? How would you describe them? I'm actually not really happy with the idea of digital native. I'm not sure no, it's necessarily it something that actually exists. Um, I think people can be digitally aware. I think they can be digitally focused. They can be digitally connected. Um, Yeah, I oh, know. I think on that one. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. I was thinking when you talk about digital fluency, it's um, we often connect it with the things now that we take for granted in our life. Like when we walk in a room, we turn on the light, and you know when the when the power goes off, how often do you still go around turning on appliances because it's just something you do. So that um, you know, for our young people, we want, and for our teachers and now for our community, we want them to be you know, at how we use the phrase at home in a digital world. So that idea of being digitally fluent and digitally capable is being um, that it's, it's something that you may be um, introduced to new ideas and new concepts, but you, being at home in a digital world means that you can um, uh, problem solve and you can approach new technologies and new ideas and concepts um, in a way that um, uh, you're empowered to do that rather than then shutting off and saying that's something I don't know about, I'm not even going to try. Yeah. Um, and for our learners, because our big focus for accelerating our learning is for our learners to, uh, our pedagogy, pedagogy around learn, create and share, being able to harness technology enables our learners to learn and create and share in ways that were never available um, even five to ten years ago. I think um, just going back um, to the drivers, I just want to pick up on something Michael said. I think the drivers have been students. The drivers for why we have this curriculum, why there's a need to talk about this, is, is the kids that are coming into our classroom and, like Michael said, are connected all day, all night. Um, and they have um, discovered that teachers, sadly, do not know more than Google. And that, that that cannot be the only source of learning. And that has had a, a, an impact on teachers needing to change the game up a wee bit, but also an opportunity to, to ensure that, that kids are leveraging off that um, technology and their access to technology for learning. So I think that's probably been the biggest driver. In terms of digital fluency and digital, digital literacy and digital natives and the terms that um, often um, come out, and I actually also, I think of digital natives as perhaps 
children or that are born into a time where technology is native to what we do. And perhaps that might be another way of looking at that. Digital literacy is simply another way of being literate. Most kids are probably digitally literate to some extent. Most adults, perhaps, you could say are digi digitally literate. Um, but fluency is something that comes, I think, with developing a deeper understanding of that literacy, whatever that literacy is. Um, so I would say that kids are probably working towards digital fluency and there's varying levels of digital fluency. Um, but in terms of being literate of a consuming um, technology, I think we've probably all got some of that. So it's about developing that and working towards fluency. And so some of the aspirations of the curriculum are to sort of take kids from that digital capable to towards fluency by able to be uh, decision makers about choosing when and where and why and how technologies can, can solve problems to, to be able to really um, uh, be decisive uh, and makers and creators as well as just the recipient. Would you like to talk a little bit more about um, what changes the actual uh, the new digital technology areas within the curriculum might make for a te in a teaching and learning context? Yeah, maybe I'll start. Um, I think probably the first thing, and I know you touched on this earlier, is that actually what we're hoping um, that children and students will start to become um, not just users of technology but creators of technology. And I think um, users or consumers. Um, and that's quite a that's quite a different skill set. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of being. And there's a lot of learning associated with that. Um, and possibly the level in which they are creators of technology will be different too. So it might be in the simplest form from using um, some type of perhaps coding to get a robot to work for young children, or it could be to a much higher level where we're actually building robots for a specific purpose and writing new code for those robots. But I think probably the biggest change is a shift from uh, students becoming, being users and consumers to creators of technology. That would be the first thing, I think. Um, yeah, I think the, um, that idea of being creators, it's, there's, there's so many different influences on who you are. Um, if you think about the, this idea of literacy, fluency, creating your footprint, um, you've got to think about how... Um, it's, we've been very good at, um, say, going on Google. Yes, Google's got every piece of information if you know where to look and how to filter it. Um, but if you... Um, there's a uh, TED Talk um, by... Uh, I can't think what his name is now. Eli something anyway, um, he, he essentially he's um, discerned that there are, every time you go onto your device um, and do a Google search, what comes out at number one, there are 57 influences on that for every individual in the room. And if people did that here and Google a word, you might, you might get 15 or 20 different um, results coming in at the top level. Now, how do you then process that? is that idea you can be literate, you can know how to do something, but what are you actually, being fluent means how do you make those decisions? Um, that's starting to come through much stronger, I think. One of the things, and then making the products themselves, um, knowing how to be um, sustainable, for instance, is what I think is gonna be a big influence on digital technologies. It's not just a case of being a, a consumer saying, uh, here's, a, here's a bot, or here's a piece of software, or here's a device that's going to um, do this for you, but saying, well, what device do I need to, to meet this challenge? How can I put together my own, um, 
my own device, how can I manage that in the best way possible to be efficient, but also to look into the future. And so it's still a usable device within two years, within five years, or it's something that can be easily adapted to become, to maintain its usability. We shouldn't, you know, we, try, we need to get away from that idea of being a throwaway society. You don't just pick up a device, use it for five minutes, and then um, find in um, a you know, short way down the road, it doesn't do what you need it to do anymore. So how do you adapt it? How do you um, turn it into something new? And that's really what that, I think, is, is behind what we need to be doing with the curriculum. Yeah, I, I think, too, I'm really interested in... in um, the opportunities, um, you know, especially around our key competencies in our curriculum, which is really strong, and that in, in being creators and use, utilising and harnessing the technology to create, we are um, also, you know, collaborating and learning how to problem solve and connect with other people, um, not just locally but globally as well. Um, that the technology enables that, but at the core of that, is, it's always going to be at the centre, as you said, it's going to be um, our young people, it's going to be people that are going to make the difference. So it's, um, and I guess thinking about what you just said then too, is that kind of throwaway, often when it's really easy, when we become that consumer society and it's really easy, that can sometimes, um, we're not harnessing those challenges to actually, I guess we call it in New Zealand that number eight wire thing, when you don't have the answers, and so that collaboration and working together to create new. Mm. I really like the idea um, that was brought up, I think, from everybody, that students are going from being the users to the creators, or we're going from being the, the users of, of, for example, Photoshop, you know, or, or Word, and now we're being able to use these tools together to create things that, you know, five years ago, teachers didn't even know how to do, or still don't even know how to do today. And I think what, what's changing in, in schools is the fact that students learn how to learn from teachers, um, I think is an important thing we, we learn how to do. I don't know if it's in the curriculum, not too um, familiar with that, but I know that we've been taught how to learn on the, uh, through, the, through these technologies. How do you do trial and error? How do you go on to Google and use these different things and find what you want, not just click the top result because that's what you got given, but finding the things that really are what you're looking for. And I think that's, I think that's something important because a teacher might tell me something at school, I might go home, research it myself and find a different answer. So that's something where I get confused, who do I listen to, what, who's, who is the right, who is right. Another question. So, so that's a really interesting point that you actually raise about where the knowledge sits, where information sits, and how we access it. So, what sort of challenges does that actually bring up for teachers implementing the curriculum? Do you want to start there, Janelle? Yeah, I think um, the challenge is wading through the millions of different places that you could get information from. And, and like Michael alluded to, that's not just a, a um, challenge for students. Adults have to go online and try and figure out if what we're reading is correct as well. Um, something really simple I talk to kids about and teachers about is triangulation. Um, but, you know, and I talk to Little E's about make a triangle. So triangles have got three corners. So if you read something, then try and see where you can find it in another two places, two different sources. So make a triangle was new knowledge. Um, and I think we do that every day. Um, often I will um, Google something, read it and go, oh, that's interesting. Then try and Google it again with a slightly different different search term, so re-change the words to see if it comes up different, and that's I'm sort of by naturally trying to triangulate that information for myself. Um, I think something else you said that was just beautiful, actually, Michael, was about teachers teaching kids how to learn how to learn, um, and I think Kevin Honeycutt adds loving to learn how to learn as well. He adds that on, which I think is really important. I think as teachers, the best we can do is um, actually just be honest with our kids and say, well, we, I think this is what it's going to be, but let's find out. And, and let me support you to find out. And what do we need to find out? And what questions should be, 
we be asking and who could we talk to? And and so really growing that self-discovery, self-directed learning skills in our kids, but also being really open with our kids that there's just no way we can know it all and, and we will get some stuff wrong, but, um, but we're willing to learn and have a go and have a try. So yeah, I think that's, that's probably going to be my advice to teachers. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not a good programmer. Um, I and I some of us could admit that even faster than <laughs> <laughs> um, And I, I'm often blown away by the time um, I've got students that are leaving um, school at 17, 18, um, the level of sophistication um, in the products that they're producing. Um, and the learning, that idea of learning how to learn and taking it outside the classroom, you know, we've passed that decades ago, we passed that point where you could be an expert in anything. I think it was the, like officially, I think it was 1984. It was the last time that you could actually say that if you were, you were an expert in a subject area. Um, now it's, um, you've got to accept that there are going to be so many different outcomes that are possible. How do you find the right outcome? How do you test a product? How do you, um, what are the parameters that you're going to be using um, before you even begin production? I think is really important. That's, that comes into that idea that, that those are the structures that, digi that the digital technology curriculum is all about. It's, um, it's yes, I've got a product, I'm going to, um, I've got a, a proposal, here's something that, I'm going, that I want to develop. I've got a nice idea or I've got, a, I've got a bug in the back of my head and I can't get rid of it. How, do I, how am I going to express it? Uh, and then you go through this sort of iterative process of, um, of developing outcomes and then you start your design process and you're looking at all the factors that are involved around you and you're thinking about who, um, who's going to be using it and who you're involved with and what you're going to use it at home and, um, and how's it going to impact on my society or on my world or other things that can be um, there. And those are huge, huge ideas to be able to um, manage. And when we're asking 13 and 14 year olds to make those big decisions. How are they going to, you can't expect that that's naturally going to happen. So that part of that teaching, the processes to allow people to make their own decisions, I think is really what it's about. And this, um, the digital technology curriculum is structured around that idea of being a process. It's not a, we're going to code or we're going to make a robot or any of those sort of outcomes, because the outcome is, is irrelevant to the curriculum itself. Um, the outcome is what best serves the person that's sitting there at the time when they're developing it. Um, and that's really exciting, that idea of, um, of going from just-in-time learning, you know, where you don't have to know everything, so there's Google. That's great. You can, you can, you can look some stuff up, but actually being at that continuous learner being able to take it out of a classroom, being able to take it out of a, out of a, um, out of a closed institutional environment, and be learning, walking through the car park, or on your way to school, or um, sitting with your mates at the weekend, you can still be processing and still be developing. And I think that's really where the, that's the exciting part of um, this development. Segues nicely into um, sort of the next sort of questions that I was going to ask about, and that was, you know, you've descri you just described then continuous learning, and Michael, you talked about learning um, outside the classroom as well as uh, inside the classroom. So, in terms of changes and developments in curriculum, who's this for? For whom is it for? When and how? How do you how do you um, respond to that, Fiona? Well, it, it, it does really work for um, the vision that we had with Manaikalani and with our learners is that having access, the first thing access did was um, take away those boundaries of nine to three. 
that that's when learning happened, um, and that was um, an opportunity to be able to access learning not only outside those times, but also connect with other people and ideas to help us with the learning. So harnessing the technology, it may be that um, the learning in terms of creating might not be specifically to create something new using the technology, but how does the technology enable you to access resources, ideas, inspiration, people, um, to, um, to be able to, try, you know, the, the ideas that you're envisaging actually make them happen. Um, and so that's been a, a, you know, a big push for that. So that's why I think that, you know, we have had, as you say, it's not new, we've had the term e-learning was in the curriculum back in 2007. Um, it's, it's something that it's, we just have to get on with doing it now, yeah. Um, just looking at the question, how everyone should everyone know how to code? Um, I think that's a really interesting question and people, I've been asked that a lot and we talk about it quite a bit at school and I think the simple answer is yes, um, but I have kind of an explanation to that. I think there's two kinds of, of programming. There's the programming that you have a problem to solve, you have something to do and you want to get it done, so there's that. But there's also like the, I don't know if I want to call it artsy or creative code, where there is nothing that you're actually making. You're, you're just having fun, you're playing around, you're seeing what you can, can make, and I think that's, that's kind of two kinds of thinking about program. Well, there's, there's numbers of way, ways um, to program. It's not just this, it's not always a logical um, process. Sometimes it's a creative process. It's not always um, so straightforward. And I think that's kind of an interesting to think, thing to think about, the fact that digital technologies isn't always the logical step-by-step -step process that we think it is, but it can be anything. Um, you know, we have these amazing um, pieces of software that we can use to create 3D models and, and animations and beautiful pieces of artwork. And it's not just being able to think about things logically, but also creative, creatively, I think is important. I think what you've been saying has re been resonating with both Chris and Janelle, so. That's really interesting. So I guess if, if I was to be asked, should everyone know how to code? I'd probably say no. But I think they should know, I, uh, no, sorry, I should clarify that. I don't think they need to know how to write code, but I think everyone should know what code is. So um, what, what I think is really important is that all students have an understanding that computers or digital devices have a language and that language um, has numbers in it and there's a number of different types of languages that the computer understands and when you put them together in a sequence that is called code and then when you do a whole lot of it that's called programming. I think that's vital that all kids know and understand that. Some kids will get excited by that and go oh I want to do that, that's something that really interests me and excites me and I want to keep learning more and more and I want to make some robots and write some um, games for computers and they may go off in that space because it really excites them. Others might go, eh, good to know, not really my cup of tea. And actually what I think is important is that New Zealand's curriculum has always allowed for that. It's allowed for those students that have a passion and a strength in something to be able to go down that track. And for others that maybe don't have a strength and passion, um, they can go down another track of something that interests them. So yes, they should know about code, they should know what it does, but possibly they won't get to coding fluency, if that makes sense. They won't dive into it so deeply that it becomes something they do a lot of. Um, and I think that that's what we need people that are proficient in that area, but we possibly don't have, well, I don't know, but we may not have um, enough jobs for everyone to be proficient in that area. So we, w we want some to be proficient in other, other areas. No, I don't think everyone's meant to be a coder, or should I say not everyone's meant to be, meant to be a programmer, but I think everyone needs to know how, what code is and how code works. Um, increasingly, uh, we're going to be working in a world um, where digital, being digitally fluent is going to be a, um, a basic job requirement. It's going, I hate the word soft skills, but it's going to be a, 
a soft skill almost it's in, in the same way as being able to talk to somebody and look them in the eye and all those other sort of things that we talk about with communication. Um, if you, the stats that are coming out at the moment, there's an, there's an economic imperative for New Zealand um, to survive into the future. Um, there are now the, the, the concept of creativity or design industry is now a higher earner than um, dairy, for instance. Um, we, we actually do really well on our world stage in terms of our population to our influence. Um, and that really needs to increase if we are going to keep working forward. And I think one of the things that um, is going to drive that is, is certainly going to be learning how to be digital, digitally, digital technologists in, in classrooms. Um, so that when you, work in, when you walk into that um, world of work, you've, um, somebody's talking about an if conditional within a for loop. You, you don't necessarily have to know how that functions, but you've got to know what, it, what it, they're talking about, why they're talking about it. You've got to be able to, to relate to those people, understand what, um, what it is that they're actually doing across the table, if you're, even if you're doing the marketing or you're doing the, the other um, things around that, um, that table. Um, the, um, I've got it written down here, I think one of the things I wrote in this question is, um, should everyone know about code even if they don't know how to program? Yes, rather than necessarily that strict um, question. Yeah, I'd have to support that. I and mean, even we were talking this morning when Janelle was describing just the experiences in um, developing um, some of the learning opportunities and, you know, talking with the, the programmers is being able to have that conversation. And I've had that, that experience before in the workplace where, you know, I've been working with programmers and graphic designers and I don't know how to do that, but I knew enough to be able to have, and I learned fast too, but to be ha able to have those conversations and see the opportunities. So while the, um, it, it might not specifically be that you're going to be going so in depth with the technology to program yourself. However, being able to connect with the people who are and understand how you can harness that to achieve what you want to achieve. You know, I think about, um, you know, some of the, the areas just you see at the moment, say that the, with the yachting, you know, the design of the, you know, watching yachting on television now is a total different experience to when, you know, it first started. Now, the people who programmed that, I'm sure they had a lot of conversations with the sailors about what that's going to look like and what it, that experience is going to be. And especially, too, in the medical field now, in the field of medicine, there are amazing uh, things happening with um, new techniques um, and the conversations that they must be having with the surgeons and the medical people. But that's that whole idea of being able to collaborate. You know, I'm not going to achieve this on my own, but I need to be able to have, form relationships and have those conversations with people to be able to harness that. Yeah. I think I'd just like to add one thing. I know that you've all kind of said that students shouldn't know how to code, but should know about code. I, I don't want to say I disagree with that, but I think that it's important for students to be able to understand how, to put it in an example, I guess, um, I was in a programming class earlier this year, and one of the things we had to do was, was a thing that you could solve in your, your, you know, on pen and paper, you could solve in your brain. But thinking about a way how to make it efficient, thinking about how to make your time useful, that you can do other things, I think that was important. It was something like finding a, a sequence of numbers, and instead of, you know, going through every single possible combination, it's thinking about what does this question really mean? What is, what is this asking? And then putting that into a program. But it's not just like digital technologies and programming classes, it's like my biology class. It's, it's thinking about, I've got to do this, how can I do this in a much more efficient way, and how can I make a better use of my time, I think was important. But I don't, like you guys say, I don't think that every student is going to want to sit there and write lines and lines of code. What you said there about this, you know, in your science class, you're making that application across the curriculum and into different learning. So you know that if you're going to be a scientist, or oh, I actually know that can be achieved, and where do I go to make that happen for me? Mm. And I think that's a really 
Um, nice segue, because I agree with what you, you've said, Michael, full-heartedly, and I think that's a nice segue to computational thinking or in the Māori Medium document, which is um, Whakaro Ruruhiko, which is about exactly what you're talking about, is the ability for students to be able to um, follow a set of instructions, write a set of instructions, um, realise that they're incorrect, go back, fix them, rewrite them, so test and debug and all of those skills that are involved in computational thinking, um, take a complex problem and break it down into tiny little steps, so decomposition and all of those skills are absolutely vital, I think, for all kids, so I totally agree with you um, that the ability to be able to look at a problem and go, what is the easiest and most time efficient way for me to be able to solve this problem? What tools will I need? How will I go about this? Is in effect computational thinking. It's about problem solving. And that is vital and that's a vital skill for everyone. I think I guess I was taking the word code in the in the physical sense of actually writing code. That possibly isn't everything uh, something every kid will learn to do, but computational thinking is vital and you're absolutely right. Um, and, and just touching on what you were saying, um, I totally agree. So in my work, I need to sometimes talk with our programmers and our coders and, and the people that we have, and I need to be able to have a conversation with them that they understand and then I understand. So that it requires me as a base level school, even though I'm not a programmer or a coder and I don't even know how to do that, I need to have a certain amount of knowledge to be able to talk with them about, well, this is what I need and to be able to understand their response when they say, well, this is what we need to do and this is what I need from you. So it is going to be a base level skill for every job, for all jobs, I think. So yeah, computational thinking, I think, is the gem in this new document, it is absolutely the gem. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, no, I, I fully agree with that and support it. It's, um, I think computational thinking is really, this is going to be that point that, that everybody, I think, will be able to um, come together and get something out of it. Um, you talked about decomposing a, you know, a problem into its into its um, individual elements, we've got um, you've you can walk into um, into a science project, or you can talk about a literacy outcome, or you can write a story and everything else, and you're doing those same tasks, and we can start to actually, I think, really truly integrate curricula. Right, we're, we're not going to be a silo where you're doing your subject area, you're doing your subject area, you're doing that thing there. I'm writing an essay here, but that's not nothing to do with my social studies project that I'm doing over there or my, my chemistry exam that I've got next week. But it's, it's that, I think that thinking is going to allow all of those connections to really start to come together and it's going to be make it much stronger. Um, that the idea of, um, these are the key terms in um, computational thinking are decomposition, abstraction, and um, algorithmic thinking and abstraction is that idea of not just being able to express something for a computer to understand, but actually expressing it in a way that a human can understand and that we can actually start to, that's how we're gonna take control of the things that we're making because we actually fully, we can, we can come to it from a point of view that makes sense to us as people. We're not looking at zeros and ones. So in a, in a high school setting at the moment. Are you what sort of what is it looking like at the moment? Are you having lots of conversations across your school staff in terms of implementation and what it looks like, or you're not quite there with the whole school staff yet? Uh, speaking from my school, I think we're starting. Um, one of the biggest barriers, I think, for teachers nationally, with this document coming out, is there's a lot of fear. Um, that suddenly everyone's going to have to be a programmer or be a coder. Um, and I think that's one of the, the conversations that needs to be had. At least we've got, what, two and a half years to start ironing out those creases until it's actually fully embedded. Um, it's exciting that it's starting um, in the new term coming. I'm um, oh, sorry, in the, um, in the new year coming. But yes, I'm having conversations with science teachers. Um, with 
an art and design teacher. Um, it, it's happened. There's, pe there's people around that have been, have been doing this for years. So I was um, uh, five, six years ago, I was teaching digital art as a class to year eights, and we were using, um, I don't know if you've come across processing as a, as a software environment, um, a coding environment for creative outcomes. It wasn't about um, making physical products, it was about making things that move, making color, um, integrating music. There's so many of those opportunities and those conversations are happening um, a lot. A lot of it's online. I'm in, a, I'm in a number of forums where these conversations are really coming out there. Every week there's a, a, very, a similar question but, and, the, and then you end up with um, hundreds of people taking part in those conversations. Really exciting time to be in. Yeah, I, was just, I was just thinking about the keynote um, this morning who talked a lot about you know, the pace of change in social media. And one thing that I'm really encouraged about is that educators in New Zealand, but globally, have been really good at harnessing the online environments and to connect and to learn. And um, uh, I think in... You know, we see a lot in the media about how social media is used, but I think it's used quite differently in education. And um, I think for those teachers who are know, you know, thinking this is coming and this is happening, and are maybe feeling a wee bit fearful about it, is to get connected. That's the first thing to do, um, not just within your schools, but you know, use harness technology. There's a lot of really good online spaces. Um, uh, in New Zealand, educators, you know, through, you know, it doesn't have to be all of them. You can choose one that's going to work for you. So it might be if it's Twitter, these that, you know, the EdChat NZ hashtag. I'll do a little plug here for the Google Educator Group that um, I'm a part part of, and we actually have. If you go onto the group, there's um, a, a hangout that was recorded maybe three years ago, all around computational thinking, and it pulled in some experts from Australia and from Google around what is computational thinking. There's also even an online course that you can do, anyone can do, students as well as, as teachers and parents on um, understanding computational thinking and, and how that might work. So um, don't be afraid, you know, reach out and look for where that's going to work for you. Yeah. So Chris, by chance, do you have any uh, younger brothers or sisters? I have a younger sister, yeah. yeah. And how many years apart? Um, she's 12 at the moment. Right, okay, so um, five years time she's finishing high school. What, what do you think it might look like for her? What would you be your aspirations for her as a learner in five years time? So, I mean at the moment she, to, I mean to give a bit of a, like a perspective to who she is, she's, she's kind of like a, a sporty kid, she doesn't necessarily enjoy um, tough problems or decisions but at her school they they tried out a um, like a programming session uh, like a programming course it was it was very simple for younger students to understand and she would come home to me and explain everything that she was doing and she was drawing snowmen and carrots with triangles and they were learning all about how to draw with this with this program and it really it was kind of interesting to me to un to kind of think about how she'd never really enjoyed this kind of um, learning before. She every time I tried to explain something to her about what I was doing, she'd just walk off. Um, so it was really interesting to to see that her and her friends were really interested in, in programming and and getting these things to work. So in terms of the future, when she gets to high school, I'm assuming it'd be the same thing. She uses a device for every class. And I think that's what digital technologies is more about than, than the, hard, the hard coding. It's all about understanding that we're using our devices, our phones, our watches, everything, every day. Uh, and for students, it's most of the day. We get to our first class, we open our device, we start writing on a word processor, we add a picture. That's, that's what digital technologies is. And we take that for granted, I think, that it's, it's really, it was easy now to add a picture to something. But... I don't know how it was like 20 years ago, but I'm assuming it wasn't as easy as it was now. Um, and then I think for her, it's going to be, in the future, it's going to be something that students take for granted if they're not taught about what it means to do these things. Um, I hope that when she does come to leave, that 
the students there and her age understand the importance of of being able to understand what you're doing with your device, understanding what you're doing with digital technologies, and how to make the best use of your time with a device or with a technology. I think that's important. Thank you. I just, um, I wonder if I might bring a kura Māori perspective in here, and um, I'm sure, I know we chatted about this earlier, but um, so there, there are two documents, so um, Digital Technologies and Hangarau Matihiko, Hangarau Matihiko being the Māori medium document, and even the English document, Digital Technologies, would, I'm sure you'll agree, um, require you to learn a whole bunch of new language. Um, and we've already mentioned some of those terms today and some of you may have heard them and thought, gosh, what are those? Um, you could imagine for kura Māori, so for teachers that work in Māori medium schools, um, at first glance, hangarau matihiko is not a very Māori concept and they teach Māori concepts. So the challenge, I guess, for kura Māori is going to be to connect that to a Māori worldview. That's the first challenge, because this is new technology that they didn't have in the time of their ancestors, so they're going to need to connect that to a Māori worldview. The second challenge is um, the language. So we didn't have Māori words for algorithms and <laughs> some of these terms, so they've needed to be created by very clever, wonderful people. Um, so our teachers in Māori Medium Kura will need to learn a whole new language as well in English and then learn also all the Māori terms or they'll, they'll learn the Māori terms first and then learn what the English terms are and, and how they work. And so there's not just going to be new skills to learn, new knowledge to learn, there's going to be a new language to learn with this curriculum for many teachers and I think we need to acknowledge that and take our time with that. The other, um, the other challenge I think for kura is like I said, touching on bringing that into a Māori worldview, and that's where computational thinking really comes to the fore. So although we may not have had iPads in the time of our ancestors, we certainly had problem solving, and we certainly have pattern recognition. So kapahaka and Māori arts are filled with repeating patterns, and you need to learn them and get them in sequence, and if they're not correct, that's that's debugging. You know, you need to come back and, and change that and fix that, and if you're making call fai fai or tuku tuku, if you put one thing wrong, you'll be able to see that. So you need to go back and fix that. And, and actually, a korowai or a cloak is not created from the end. It's a big task that's broken up into small little bits. So we do the feathers, and then we do the tipari, and we do it all in, in little small parts. Um, that is a precise set of instructions that needs to be followed. So this is how we're going to be able to put it in a Māori world view for our students. And I think the same applies for the English medium document, is we, we probably won't want to sit our six and seven year olds and say, we could, today we're going to teach you about um, algorithms. <laughs> What we'll start off talking to them about is, what did you do in the playground? Oh, you did that. How might we get from this point to that point? Let's write some instructions. Why don't you get your friend to follow them? Where's the, where's the problem in that? Did it work? Oh, we need to fix them and do them again. This is how we're going to teach these concepts to our kids. We're not going to sit down and teach them about binary code. We're going to talk to them about everyday, real-life context. So in terms of curriculum integration, there is absolutely no end to how this can be integrated into all curriculum areas. And um, I believe teachers just do that naturally really well because they do that every day. Um, so I, I think this document provides hugely exciting opportunities for both our tamariki and also for our kayako. Um, can I just do a, I'm going to do a quick sales pitch as well. Oh, yeah, I think it's since we're on it. <laughs> um, uh, one of the supports that um, it is there, there is a, um, a New Zealand National Teachers Association for Digital Technology. Um, and that act it as we were. We've just rebranded to um, um, DTTA, D -T -T um, Digital Te Technology Teachers Aotearoa. Um, one of the things that we are looking to do, we were a secondary organisation, we've actually um, changed our constitution, so now we are reaching out to, um, to primary. Um, we're reaching out to Kura Kaupapa. Um, we're providing 
um, online forum and spaces for people to have these conversations and communicate, um, getting people involved in it. There's a lot of other, um, there's a lot of hashtags around that you could look up, um, CS for PD, uh, CS for HS, high school, and CS for PS, primary school. Um, they're all there. We're, we're, ground, we're at ground level at the moment, um, but that conversation is slowly beginning to happen and um, we've got 500 digital technology teachers who are currently working and who are available for support for anybody who wants to get into this realm. Fiona, would you like to just talk, because it's a, a really nice point that, um, that Chris is raising about connecting and connecting teachers. Would you like to talk a little bit about where you see the opportunities with connecting with Fano more? You touched on it earlier, but can yeah. you come back to that? Um, yeah, and it, ha it has been really critical for um, when we've harnessed the technology for um, Manaia Kalani for the education program that right from the start, it was um, all about partnering with with families and with the community, so that um, they were always part of the conversation critically. And the first question that was is always asked is, you know, what are your aspirations and your um, for your for your for your children? And you know, so those kind of questions are really important. I think too that. Um, the best conduit for connecting with community is our young people. So um, by you know, empowering our young people to be able to um, communicate and harness the technology for connecting um, online and creating and learning and sharing their learning, um, that um, they are able to uh, support and have access there for parents as well. I mean, we do it a lot through using very visible learning spaces. So from the teachers sharing um, their planning and the learning in a, a visible online space that parents can access, so it's not closed down, that the learners are also sharing their learning in visible spaces as well. Um, my, well my colleague, Dorothy Burt, brought up a really important point a couple of years ago when we were talking, you know, really looking at the, the, the visible spaces for learning is that in some ways, you know, you think about technology and you think about online and how it really supports visible teaching and learning, but it also in, on, is another element where it can shut things down. So you move from, um, move from how learning just happening from nine to three in the classroom parents would come in and they could connect with the learning, they could see it on the walls, it was on books, you could talk about it. Um, and then having the technology was straight away, we're like, oh, there's so many opportunities here to connect with, with community and with whānau. But if there's no, if that accessibility isn't there, so if the learning is locked down online, then straight away you're actually um, going backwards. So I think it's really important that the learning that's happening in the school, wherever possible, is visible. So that's, you know, whether that's online in sites, you know, you come into a lot of schools now and they've got, um, you know, the televisions up and the learnings always, you know, the spaces where, where parents congregate to come and pick up their children. You know, often I go into schools now and there's big screens up there that they can connect. So there's, you know, the technology is really, um, can empower that, yeah. Michael, what's your thoughts on, on the way technologies can support homes and school or home and, uh, school and community partnerships? So between home and school, I guess, going back to what I said at the beginning about how students, students use, oh, I mean high school students at least, use technology all the time. Like they're in class, they're on the device, they get out of class, they're on their phone, they go home, they're on their phone, they go home, they're on their device, they watch TV. All these things, our lives revolve around our devices and quite frankly most of us wouldn't be able to survive without them. <laughs> so I think that something important is to be able to kind of integrate that and not, and not have students abuse the fact that they sometimes know more at school than the teachers or the, their, other, their other students. I think it's important to kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but kind of like have this, this society or this, this, I, this place where digital technologies and the, the things that you use can be integrated between the home and the school 
in such a way that you never stop learning. You're always, you're always learning. You're always having new information, and we do. I mean, I think digital media in terms of like the news is a really great example that you can always be constantly fed this information. Like, if something happens in North Korea, my phone buzzes, and there I have access to this information. I think it's important for students to be able to... I think the opportunity here is that students can integrate their learning throughout the day, and I think we do that already. Like, my school uses Google Drives and uh, Google Drive and Schoology, and... Um, we have access to all of the learning information that we need at home. So if we feel that it's, some of our teachers say, if, we, if they feel it's, we can learn that better at home in our own environment, that they're okay with that, as long as we get the work that we need done. I think um, in terms of engaging with whānau and communities, there's kind of two things. I think schools can be engaging through digital technology. So that could be things like a school Twitter page, a Facebook page, even um, school portfolios, where they are sharing the learning um, in a digital media, if you like. Um, but there's also, it's really vital that schools are engaging with whānau and community um, about digital technologies, so through and about, both equally important. And I know um, often a lot of friends and people that I meet in schools, um, the first questions they want to ask me is, can you please tell me what Snapchat is and what my kid's doing with it? <laughs> and that's what they want to know. And so schools, we need to be more proactive about that and say, well, actually, this is this is the new app and, and these, this is the app that, my, that we're finding most of our students are using. This is what it does. Um, because kids don't rush home to tell mum, this is the app I've downloaded and this is what I'm doing on it. But Parents need to know that. They need to know what their kids are doing. They need to know how to keep them safe and perhaps what boundaries they need to set up. So um, it's vital that schools are ensuring that their parents know as much as possible about digital technologies as well as um, engaging with them through the use of, of digital tech. I might just do another little plug. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah with... Um, with the technology, one of the first things that we realised was that we were going to have to actually explicitly teach being cyber smart online. So it wasn't enough to just say, well, here's, you've got a one-to-one -one device now, you've got a Google account, you've got a drive, you can get on the internet whenever you want to, 24-7, which is what we want, that accessibility, but at the same time, really supporting our learners to be empowered so that when they're connecting, they are making smart decisions. We want them to be able to have authentic connections online because um, once they're you know, outside, well, especially once they're over 18, they're going to, you know, it's going to be up to them. And if they don't experience that in an authentic context while they're learning um, and in a situation where they're being kept safe by their parents and by the school, um, then it's going to be a lot harder because, it's, again, it's going to, we, we can't foresee every single um, situation that's going to come up. But what we want to be confident about is that our learners are going to be empowered to stop and think and make the right decision for them. So I think it's, I agree, it's really vital. And um, helping the you know, parents to understand that as well. So, again, that's being really explicit. So we, we'd like to think it would be always just integrated into the curriculum, but we've had to be quite explicit about teaching that. Um, as teachers and our learners grow in confidence, it's become more integrated in some areas, but it still needs to be explicitly taught at the moment. And um, also, it's vis very visible too in everything that we do, right from how the learners are sharing their learning and how the teachers are sharing their learning and, and how we're designing these learning opportunities. Yeah. As, a, as an educator and as a parent, when I look at my kids, they span nine years. So my eldest is 24, my youngest is 25, uh, 25 is 15, is going on 25, but 15. Um, <laughs> But my youngest is a very, very different learner to her brothers. Not because she's a girl, but because of the impact of digital technologies. 
And I was thinking back to one of the things that Brad said this morning was, was that when he realised that the kids were changing and he hadn't been changing and that was a, a driver and an impetus for, the, for him. So can you think of one thing, because we're coming towards the end now, can you think of one thing that you would like to sort of say as an encouragement to a teacher who might be thinking, wow, there's so much change, where do I start? I was going to bring something up before. I think it's important that teachers have enough of the that enough of the focus about digital technologies is on the teachers as well themselves, because just like the students, it's very easy. I'm I mean I'm not a teacher, so I'm not speaking on behalf of teachers, but I I can see that it's very hard to for teachers to keep up when there's hundreds of new things happening every day. There's hundreds of things that students are learning every day when they go home, and I think it's important that there's an environment or a place that parents and teachers can go to be able to learn how to teach, uh, if there's their, their children or their, their students, that digital technologies is an important part and that we need to respect and um, be safe with, not online, but just safe using digital technologies and I think that's important. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I just have to agree with you there and say a little bit of what I said before. It is really harness your networks as teachers. Um, there, um, it does require, if you're new to it, a little bit of um, you know an effort on your part to start with. But once you do harness that and find the right place for you, and there are so many people that can help you with that. And if you're at a conference like you learn, it's everywhere. Um, but it's not something you have to do on your own. The, I think in the last 10 years, what's helped me grow and change in terms of my, my, um, my practice has been pe the people that I've connected with. If I hadn't connected with... Um, I mean, I think I connected with you, Chris, online first through like an online environment like Twitter it was, I think, but a lot of the educators that I've come in contact with that I've learnt from and that have really helped me and my practice have been um, through harnessing those networks, and I'd really encourage you know people to do that. It's communication, it's connecting, it's all those things. Um, one of the um, things for, I, I suppose for a piece of advice for uh, te uh, teachers, I went through a list of the um, just the things that I'm involved with um, just within the next um, four to five weeks, um, and it, you can think about then how we're going to be able to make digital technology go umbrella, go sideways across the curricula. As, um, um, we're doing, um, doing e-textiles, microcomputers, robotics, we're programming, we're doing electronics, animation, audio, video, still images, photo editing, digital painting, there's a little bit of VFX, um, and then that doesn't even get into things like um, electronic control of garden environments. And so I'm building a greenhouse or we'll be building a greenhouse very soon and start to integrate digital technologies into the control of, um, of our, the world that we can, are going to be growing, how we're going to feed ourselves. Um, so I'm, I can't see how that any teacher couldn't pick one out of something within that um, broad context to get involved with. It's not, you don't have to do everything. You can just pick one thing and, and, um, and then see if you can um, develop that and do that well and ask and look for people who are doing it already and get connected. Cool. Yeah, I think um, I'm pr probably going to sound a bit hard-lined now, but I'm just going to be honest and say I think that developing digital literacy is just a prerequisite to being a teacher. I just think you have to. Our kids cannot afford to not be developing digital confidence, exploring the digital world. They will be disadvantaged if they're not working towards digital fluency in their education lifetime. So it's just actually a given, I think, for teachers. We need to be using digital technologies in our classroom program. And what that looks like and how you go about that is, is where, you, where teachers have agency and they can and give great consideration for that but our kids need to be working towards that it's just vital and it's not just vital for their skills in the workforce those of us um, who are aging are going to be in that life that they're going to be working in and we need them to do a really good job 
we're going to be relying on them to do a great job. So it's in all of our best interest. So probably the advice I'd give to to teachers is um, is feel the fear and do it anyway. You can't afford to wait. You can't afford to wait till you get good at it. Give it to your kids. Let them play. Let them explore. Learn alongside them. And don't be afraid to not know. It's okay to say, I have no idea. Will you help me? And let's learn about that. Um, but I see, sadly, too many iPads with dust on them because teachers aren't confident, and I think we need to help them get past that. Don't worry about it. Just get them out in the classroom. Let the kids play, and let's learn together. And, and we need to, I think, as a profession, like you said, strengthen each other in our confidence by sharing those ideas and those connections. Fantastic. So a couple of provocations there as well. Um, so last wonderings or, or provocations for people? I just wanted, there is that sense of urgency. You, you, you're dead right about that, you know. Um, that I was reading, I mean, New Zealand just recently was acknowledged in some study about actually preparing, we'd be the best for preparing um, our young people digitally, which was really encouraging. Um, but if you wait, you're right, because it's not, it's not like we're progressing one year by one year, that every year it's doubling. So if, you know, if you're waiting, it's actually you know, two to three, four years time, we're gonna be 20, 25 years progression and more. So that sense of urgency, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, provocation is um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. We keep talking about it being such a valid way of learning is to actually, um, for students to fail. You learn through failure. Teachers have got to be afraid to fail as well. I've got to be confident to fail, not afraid of um, making a mistake in a digital realm. It's, um, that is how you are going to get better. If everything um, works perfectly every single time you do something, then you're just going to um, become that passive consumer again. I really like that because students, we, we fail all the time with digital technologies and we just get back up, ask for help and keep going. And I think for students to see that teachers as well are learning with us and learning alongside us would be a really, would be a really good thing, I think, for students to see that, that the teachers are, te are people too. They're just like us. I mean, you guys, are, I mean, teachers are like us, but to see that that they're learning the way we learn and that um, they want to learn. I think that's an important thing for students as well. Um, when te Sometimes you might feel that teachers teaching you it because they have to. And I think it's important for teachers to know and understand how important digital technologies are so that they can f f make their students feel like they want to learn it about, about it as well. And I think that makes the learning environment a bit more uh, inclusive. Uh, so, probably a couple of quotes from some very well-known poets. Ice Cube says, the worst thing you can do is to do nothing. So, uh, that would be my provocation for teachers, just don't do nothing. And um, if you do do something, like William Wairua would say, do the mahi, get the treats. If you do something, you will be rewarded through uh, the learning of your children. Nga mihi. I, look, just to close off, I really appreciate what everybody's had to say, but one thing that really stands out for me is what you just said, uh, Michael, and that was uh, the enthusiasm for, for a vision where teachers are learning so alongside students, and that vision for learning as a sort of an ecosystem where we learn together, we connect together within schools, between schools, across the communities is a fantastic way to end. If the digital technologies, hangaro matahiko, um, uh, aspect of the curriculum can help stimulate that, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope, um, I haven't actually asked you guys if you've had questions because we've just been so busy talking, but um, I have really enjoyed the, com uh, the conversation and the perspectives that you've brought. So thank you very, very much. Can you join us? Well done.